All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Uh, I'm really excited today because we are wrapping up our entire month of November dedicated to space, space exploration, aeronautics. We've had people as diverse as NASA research scientists, astronauts, and, and everyone in between. Uh, and we are capping off our last day in the best possible way. So we are joined live from the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum by the John and Adrian Mars director of that museum, Dr. Ellen Stofan, who before this was in a role, another one of the best jobs in the world, uh, in a role as science director at NASA. So without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Dr. Stofan, and take it away. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here and talk to everybody uh, today. So what I'd like to do today is to give you a little background on, on my background, uh, what I did at NASA, why it's important that we study the planets, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing right now at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. And I hope for any of you who haven't been to the museum that you get to come someday because it really is the most amazing place in the world, and yes, I am biased about it. So. What I'm going to do is uh, show some slides, and hopefully, technically, this is going to work. Uh, let's see where it went. No, nope, wrong thing. Um, here we go. Uh, and you're set. OK. So what I'm going to talk about today is is why we explore the planets. And this is the most amazing view that the astronauts get to see every day from the International Space Station, our planet, which even while I talk about other planets, I like to make sure everybody understands that the most important planet in our solar system is, of course, Earth, uh, because it is the planet that we live on. And so far, it's really the only planet that we've been able to find that is capable of hosting life in as large and as diverse a form, uh, form as we find here on our blue planet. So this is our favorite planet, the planet we love the most. And one of the other things that I'm gonna come back to in a little bit is I want you to think about this view of the planet that the astronauts get. And one of the things every astronaut who comes back from space, which I have not had the ability to do, is something called the overview effect, something about how we look at the planet from space. One of the things they always take away is how ocean covered our planet is. Of course, it's one thing to say 70% of Earth's surface is covered by oceans, but when you spend all day going around it and looking at it, you really realize how much water is below you. The other thing I really want you to notice is, is look at that thin blue line that separates the surface of the Earth uh, from outers, that black, black, blackness of outer space. Um, that's our atmosphere. And you know, when we're down here on the surface of the earth and we look up, our atmosphere looks huge because it just seems to go on and on and on. But when you consider the fact that the astronauts are orbiting in the International Space Station about the distance above us as the distance between New York City and Boston, our atmosphere is actually quite thin. Uh, and because of that, it's quite fragile. And I know all of you have heard about climate change, uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, these are the planets that I've studied. And when I study planets, I really am always thinking again about our home planet Earth. Now, the planet in the upper left is Venus. And you might say, well, it doesn't look like much. It's just kind of these orangey clouds. And Venus is perpetually covered in clouds. It's the planet that's the closest to us. Of course, it's also closer to the sun than we are. But you know, Venus should only be about 15 to 20 degrees warmer than the Earth uh, because it's closer to the sun. And instead, it's um, about uh, 900 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface, so incredibly hot. Uh, and it's because Venus has something called a runaway greenhouse atmosphere. It has a lot, a lot, a lot of carbon dioxide in its atmosphere that traps the sun's heat and it's heated the planet up. And so when people talk about climate change and greenhouse atmospheres, Venus is the reason that we understand greenhouse atmospheres so well and that we can compare the Earth's atmosphere. Now, scientists are pretty sure that no matter how much carbon dioxide on Earth we put into the 
atmosphere, we're not going to end up like Venus. But boy, Venus is an experiment that we don't don't want to get too close to. Now, I really like to study Venus because it's made of the same kind of rocks as as Earth. It's about the same size as the Earth. And therefore, you'd say, well, if you started out with two planets that were so similar, okay, one's a little bit warmer because it's closer to the sun. Why did they turn out so differently? Why is one so hot? I mean, we jokingly call Venus um, Earth's evil twin. Um, and, and Earth is kind of just right. And there actually is something called the Goldilocks hypothesis, which talks about the fact that we have life on Earth because Venus is too cold, or Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, and Earth is just right. But of course, as a scientist, my big question is, why is Venus too hot? Why did it evolve to this point where it's uninhabitable? And we actually think that very early in Venus's history, it was actually not that different from the Earth, and it went down a very different path. And as we start looking for planets around other stars that could support life, understanding why Venus went down one road and Earth went down another is actually really important. Now, Mars, you see down in the lower left, and Mars is one of my favorite places because we do think, again, Venus, Mars, and Earth very early in their histories were similar. They probably had water on their surface. We know on Mars that water, we had probably an, an ocean's worth of water on its surface that went on, that lasted for over 500 million years. Now, that's important because life began in Earth's oceans. And it stayed in Earth's oceans for over a billion years. You know, it took a hugely long time of, of evolution to get to us. Um, and so Earth, uh, Mars is really important because we think that maybe life had a chance to evolve on Mars. But then Mars, because of a series of circumstances um, that we think we do understand, um, Mars is tiny. It's about a third the size of the Earth. It started cooling off. It lost its magnetic field, which protects Mars's atmosphere from outer space. The, um, the Mars's atmosphere started to thin and thin and thin, and so it got very cold. So life either went extinct on Mars or it retreated underground, and it's actually still there. Um, and so NASA has a huge program of trying to understand Mars. Now, the planet on the lower uh, right is technically not a planet. It's actually a moon. And you can see sort of hanging right next to it as this giant planet with rings, which of course you recognize as Saturn. So that little fuzzy orange ball is a moon of Saturn called Titan. And Titan is a, one of my favorite places in the solar system because Titan is the only moon in the solar system that actually has a substantial atmosphere. It's actually mostly nitrogen like Earth's atmosphere. But you know, Saturn is really far away from the sun. Uh, it's over 100 million miles from the Earth. Uh, and so it's really cold out there because you're so far from the sun. And on the surface of Titan, it's, it's a totally cool place because there are actually seas, rivers, lakes all over the surface of Titan. But you're thinking, wait a minute, you just told me it was really cold on Titan. How could you have rivers and seas and lakes? Well, it turns out, out there in the outer solar system, what's a liquid at those cold temperatures is basically liquid gasoline. So think of a river of basically gasoline. It rains gasoline. They have a complete water cycle like the one you guys have learned about, evaporation, precipitation. They have that same thing except the fluid is different. It's, it's again, liquid methane and liquid ethane, which are two of the um, components that we have in gasoline that helps your car go. So cool place, really cool place. Who would think that so far out in the solar system is the only other place in the solar system where we can go to study how does a lake or a sea interact with the atmosphere? Um, how do waves work? How does, how does a shoreline change over time? So we have to go out to Saturn to figure that out. Now, the features I've spent most of my career studying are actually volcanoes. Um, and the two photos on the left are of Hawaii. Uh, the, the top photo is the big island of Hawaii as seen from space. And you can very clearly see some of the big volcanoes, Kilauea and Mauna Loa that, uh, and Mauna Kea, that, that sit on the big island of Hawaii. And down below is me standing on a lava flow, an active lava flow, um, in Hawaii a couple of years ago. And you see, I'm kind of looking a bit uncomfortable. 
And that orange thing I'm standing by is called a skylight. It's basically, I'm, I'm standing over top of a river of molten hot rock. So that's lava that you can see below. I'm standing on a relatively thin crust, but it's very strong. It, it holds my weight easily. And that's that orange glow is actually lava that's rushing like a river under the surface. And the amount of heat coming out because that lava is um, at over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, so the amount of heat coming out of that hole is is like when you on a on a time when maybe you're cooking a Thanksgiving turkey and you stand too close to the oven and somebody opens it and a big blast of hot air hits you. That's what it's like standing next to a skylight. But active lava flows are really fun to understand. Now the volcano on the top um, top right is called uh, Olympus Mons. It's on Mars. It's the largest volcano in the solar system. The one below it is a, vol a volcano on Venus called Mat Mons. Uh, it's also a huge volcano, but not that different in size from the volcanoes that we see on Hawaii. Now you might say, okay, wow, there's volcanoes on different planets. There are. We even have them on Titan, that little moon of Saturn that I showed in the previous slide. And I study volcanoes around the solar system because what I really want to know is how do volcanoes work here on Earth? And I can, by comparing volcanoes on other planets to where the conditions are slightly different, maybe the rocks are drier, the atmosphere is different, uh, maybe the rocks are made of totally different material, that helps us understand the the processes that govern how a volcano works. And I'd like to use the analogy, just think if you were a doctor and you have had only one patient, you would never understand diseases like the flu or diabetes if you only had one patient. And for a geologist studying how does a volcano work, it really helps to have lots of volcanoes on different planets to compare back to this planet. And it helps us understand things like when is a volcano going to erupt? When it does erupt, how far are the lava flows going to go? And this is really important on Earth because, you know, there are places like we've seen in Hawaii over the last year where there was a huge volcanic eruption that that burnt up a lot of people's houses. We have people in Washington state who live uh, near uh, Mount Rainier, which is an active volcano. And certainly in Italy, most of you have heard of Pompeii. Uh, that was an eruption of Mount, uh, a town that was destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. And Mount Vesuvius is still an active volcano, and it sits right above the city of Naples in Italy, which is a very, very crowded city. So we live near volcanoes, so we have to learn how they behave uh, in order to keep us all safe. Now, I mentioned Mars, um, and Mars is one of our favorite places because, again, it goes back to this question of was there ever life on Mars? And, and I hope some of you noticed this past week we had a new spacecraft land on Mars. Um, it was sent there by NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, where I used to work years ago. Uh, and we're really excited. That spacecraft is actually going to be called the InSight, is going to be looking at the inside of Mars. But really what I think it's going to take to figure out, did life ever really form on Mars? It's gonna take astronauts. And this is just an artist rendering that was done by a company um, of a possible future human mission to Mars. Um, and it's really my goal, and you guys are what we like to call the Mars generation because you're actually about the right age of pe the first people who will walk on Mars. So I hope one of the girls out there is listening, is thinking about the fact that she could be the first one uh, to walk on Mars. Um, and why do we need people? Why can't we just send spacecraft? Well, you know, I'm a geologist, so you saw that picture of me out in Hawaii. And I think it's going to take geologists, biologists, all kinds of different people out walking around Mars, picking up a lot of rocks to find those fossil, that fossil evidence that we really did have life on Mars. Um, and right now, NASA is working on a plan to get humans back to Mars, and we think it'll happen in the 2030s. Uh, which again is about what makes you guys the right age to be the first Mars astronauts. But as I said, you know, when we're studying other planets like Mars, when we're thinking about where else could life be, when we think about how do volcanoes work, you know, why do we have earthquakes? You know, uh, Insight is going to be studying Mars quakes. You know, it's all to get back to this point of when we're trying to understand how a planet works, we want to bring that information back to our own planet and really try to understand better how it works. 
And obviously, I know you guys have heard of climate change, but a lot of what NASA spends its time doing is measuring what's happening on the planet right now. The bottom photo here is from Miami Beach in Florida. And because NASA has been able to very much measure that sea level is rising all around the planet. Now, why that's happening is because as the planet gets warmer, the seawater, the ocean water gets warmer and warm water expands, it gets bigger. So if you heat up a glass of water in, in a microwave, it's actually gonna stand slightly higher than a cold glass of water because hot things expand. So that's what we're actually seeing in the oceans. It's a combination between what we call thermal expansion or as the oceans warm, they stand higher. And there's also a contribution to sea level rise um, from melting ice. And up on the top photo um, is a NASA rendering of Greenland. And what we've been measuring in Greenland over the last, especially 15 years, is a huge amount of melting of ice off the Greenland um, landmass. We see this in uh, Antarctica also. And all that melting ice, of course, turns into water and it goes into the oceans. And that's also contributing to sea level rise. And so the melting of ice we see in Greenland, the high tides that we see going on in Miami Beach that are starting to regularly flood the streets and they're having to lift up buildings and lift up roads is because of the fact that our climate is changing. And we know from decades of scientific research, it's because we're putting too much carbon dioxide in the air from burning fossil fuels. And again, we, we know that because we have other planets that we can compare that have carbon dioxide in their atmospheres like Mars, like Venus. We can study the climate on Titan, Saturn's moon. So it really helps that we have these other planets to compare their climates to Earth climate to help us understand what's happening. And so that's why it's incredibly important that we all think about our decisions, whether it's recycling, whether it's reusing something rather than getting something new um, and just reducing what we use uh, because our planet is this beautiful uh, blue planet and we wanna keep it that way. Now to switch gears a little bit, I wanna talk a little bit about Air and Space Museum and then I want you guys to be thinking about questions because I actually like answering questions better than I like talking. Um, I work at the, again at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. It opened 42 years ago, long before any of you were born. When they built the museum, they thought, well, maybe we'll get sort of one to two million people a year. We actually had two million people in the first month the museum opened. So we've had over 350 million, which is more than the population of the United States, come through our doors in the last 42 years. We actually have two museums. We have one on the National Mall right near the Capitol building um, in Washington, DC. And then we have another museum um, at Dulles Airport in Virginia called the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center. And while I love both of my museums, I'm pretty partial to the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center, which is where I am today, because we actually have a space shuttle here. We have the space shuttle Discovery. Um, and it's pretty, and I'm pretty amazing to stand next to something and say, you know, that thing went to space. How cool is that? We over, have over 69,000 artifacts and of our airplanes, um, and we have a lot of airplanes, many of them are the airplane that went the fastest or it was the first of its kind, or it's the only one left of its kind. Now, the fun thing is, for me, we're in the midst of having to totally repair our building downtown. Remember I said how many people have come in, that one to two million we expected, and instead we get seven to eight million visitors a year. Well, in 42 years, they've basically worn out the building and it's falling apart. So we're having to do a lot of repairs. We're never gonna close while we're repairing the museum. But it gives us the opportunity to redo the galleries and the museum and kind of tell stories um, in a new way. And this is just um, an artist's conception of what one of the new galleries is gonna look like. It's gonna be called One World Connected. And it's gonna talk about how the fact that we've been observing the earth from space um, for 60 years now, NASA just celebrated it, its 60th birthday, um, that observing the earth from space has really made us look at our planet in a new way. It's actually changed really fundamental things from how we communicate. Think about your phones. Those, uh, when you use your phone to get directions, you're relying on satellites called the Global Positioning System or GPS satellites. When you get weather data, 
And when you say, oh, it's going to rain tomorrow, we know that uh, in large part because of satellite data, weather satellite data that we get back. So you might not know it, but space is actually playing a role every minute almost of your lives. And so this gallery is going to talk about that. And we're going to show a lot of the uh, most recent data that's coming back from NASA. And we're going to show things like how farmers use space data to farm better. So lots of fun things that we're going to have in the new museum. One of the other things that we're going to be really careful about in the new museum is to make sure that we're telling all the stories of people that were involved in aviation and space exploration. You know, when I was when I was your age and I wanted I thought about becoming a scientist, I would look for books in the library about women who'd become scientists. And you know, I could hardly find any. Most of you have heard of, about Marie Curie or Florence Nightingale. Those were like the only books I could find. But the interesting thing is, you know, there have been lots and lots of women who've contributed all along to making uh, aviation happen, making flying happen, making us able to explore uh, and keeping us safe. In the lower left there, the Tuskegee Airmen, who were African-Americans who helped uh, fight in the air in uh, World War II, amazingly heroic soldiers. Uh, in the top uh, left is uh, Amelia Earhart, uh, who was the first woman to fly across the ocean. Um, in the top center is a woman you may not have heard of, but I think everybody should have heard of her. She's an amazing woman. Her name was Bessie Coleman, and she was an African-American woman who in the 1920s decided she wanted to become a pilot. But no African-Americans had, had pilot's license and certainly not women. So she actually went to France to get her pilot's license. And then she came back to the United States and was a barnstormer. She flew in air shows and she ultimately died in an aircraft accident. But, you know, I particularly love her because at that time we had something called the Jim Crow laws where African-Americans and whites, a lot of times African-Americans weren't allowed to go to the same places as whites, they were kept separate. And she refused to fly at air shows um, where that was the case. So she was very brave on so many fronts. Uh, in the bottom center is a, the first Hispanic uh, astro, Latina astronaut. Her name is Ellen Ochoa. And on the right is Mae Jemison, who was the first African-American astro, uh, woman astronaut. And, and I think it's important to tell all these stories because I want every kid who walks into the museum to think, I'm going to make a big contribution. Someday I'm going to invent a new kind of airplane. I'm going to be the one to walk on Mars, and I'm going to be featured in this museum. Now, for the next year, we're going to be talking a lot about the Apollo program. Now, this happened long before you guys were born. I'm sure you've heard of it, though. It was when Americans walked on the moon. They landed on the moon for the first time on July 20th of 1969. So we're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of that next summer. It's really exciting. The Apollo program actually started before that, and then it went on through Apollo 17. So we actually had nine different uh, missions to the moon, five of which actually landed on the surface of the moon. So a lot of astronauts walked on the surface of the moon. We just didn't go once. Um, and this is a big celebration because we want to think about like, wow, how did we do that? How did we go from President Kennedy saying that we were going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade in eight and a half years, the United States actually accomplished it. And right now, NASA is talking about sending humans back to the moon and on to Mars. And how are we going to do that? You know, there were over 400,000 Americans who helped make the Apollo program happen. You only think about the astronauts, but there were men and women all across this country who helped make Apollo happen. So it's going to be a fun year. And I hope you guys are thinking about this because walking on another planet is an amazing thing. And again, some of you could be the first people who walk on Mars. Um, so I... Uh, hope that you guys from these slides have come up with a lot of questions and uh, I'm hoping now that we can spend some time uh, with me answering those questions. Outstanding. Well, thank you so, so much for that presentation. That was great. Uh, yeah. So let's start with Miss Tracy's grade fours in San Jose. You guys want to talk? She's asking. Jane, go ahead. Ask a um, Why was she ever interested in being an astronaut? Why was she interested in being a scientist? Uh, which woman? Or me? Why am I interested? Why was I interested in being a scientist? 
You yeah. know, that's a great question. I think when I was growing up and I was your age, I was somebody who just always wanted to know why. You know, and I would I would walk outside and see like a hill or a mountain or a river valley. And I would say, you know, why is that there? Has it always been there? How did it get there? And when I was about your age, my mom <clears throat> was taking a, a college course in geology and she took me along on the field trip. And I was walking down a stream bed with these stone, you know, rock walls on either side of me. And the geology professor could look at those layers of rock and it was like he was telling a story because each of those layers of rock, um, by just looking at them, he could tell what that place was like hundreds of millions of years before. And so to me, geology was like this amazing, fun puzzle where by looking at rocks, you could actually solve a puzzle. What was the earth like in the past? And how could you use that to understand what could happen in the future? And so to me, science and geology was all about like solving puzzles, trying to figure out why. And I just thought it was a lot of fun. And I have to tell you all, I did not love math. Um, I, I kind of struggled in math. And I talk to so many people now who say, well, I wanted to be a scientist but I wasn't great at math, so I didn't do it. And I'm telling you, if you at all think you wanna be a scientist, stick with it, you can do it. I'm living proof that you don't have to be great at math. You don't have to be a straight A student to be a scientist. Great answer. And it's astonishing actually how many of the people we do hangouts with uh, struggled in math in school. So you're not alone in that. <laughs> uh, all right, let's head to the most like beautifully named school in town of all time. So we have the group in Brook Forest Elementary, grade fives in Oak Brook, Illinois. <laughs> if you guys want to join us for a second question, come on up. If you had a different job, what would it be? <laughs> um, the first astronaut to walk on Mars, but I'm too old. You guys are going to be the first people to walk on Mars. Just think how amazing it would be to be an astronaut to go to Mars. And I would miss my family. So I'm not saying I've got three kids. I would, I would be, miss my family if I went to Mars. But just think how fun it would be to be wandering on the surface of another planet, breaking open rocks, and you look down at that rock and you see a fossil-like worm, and you're like, oh my gosh, I just discovered life on Mars. How cool would that be? So that's probably my, my would be my dream job. Very cool. Uh, all right, let's head to Mr. Lavogue's class in North Palm Beach, Florida, grade eight. Hey. Um, we were wondering if, if you could discover anything in the universe, like about whatever you were studying at NASA, if you could find one thing, what would you choose to find? You know, um, NASA in the last about five years has discovered over 3,000 planets around other stars. Most of them, um, most of them with a, a telescope called the Kepler Space Telescope that just actually we finally, it finally died uh, a couple months ago. Um, and so my dream discovery would really be returning that first image of a blue planet, uh, <coughs> a blue planet from another galaxy, another solar system um, that looks just like the Earth. In science, we always, in the, my field, we always joke about Earth 2.0. So we're looking for this planet that looks like Earth around another star. We're still probably about 20 years away from the technology to actually image a planet around the, another star to get that image of that blue planet that looks like Earth. But we're only about, three years away from instruments that I can actually study the atmospheres of stars around other planets. Um, and if we had better, easier control of the microphones, I would ask you guys, what are the gases that you would think would be associated with life on other planets? And you're gonna think about gases like oxygen, right? Because we all need oxygen. You're gonna think about water because obviously like life on earth here needs water. Gases like methane, um, Methane on Earth is produced by, um, by life, grossly, by cows burping and doing what other things cows do, produces a lot of methane. Um, and so those are the kind of gases we're going to be looking at. And, and you guys, again, because we've discovered these 3,000 planets around other stars, some of them are the right distance away from their parent star to maybe be blue planets. As you guys, if some of you want to be astronomers or astrophysicists or planetary scientists like me, you're going to have not just the planets in our solar system to study, but these thousands of planets around other stars and to be able to say, hey, I see these gases and, and look at this one. There's one where 
All those gases are constantly changing, which means there's something dynamic going on. And maybe that thing that's causing the atmosphere to change is life. Really cool. It's going to happen in your lifetimes. We're going to say we've found life beyond Earth. You have enough enthusiasm for 10 people, uh, so you're in the right <laughs> job. Uh, all right, uh, let's head to so the Laurel Spring School. So Miss Wafer uh, oversees like hundreds of kids around the world uh, that are all joining us live on YouTube right now. So she's going to pass along a question from one of them. Yeah, if you see me looking uh, to my right, it's because that's where my students are on a separate screen. And if you see me using my phone, it's because they're texting me questions. So Rebecca well, is in Texas. She's in the seventh grade and she's wondering, I'm getting a lot of questions about where can we live? Can we live on Titan? Um, if we go to Mars, um, will you not be able to come back? But Rebecca's asking if we leave the Milky Way, can humans ever leave the Milky Way and go beyond the Milky Way? Well, you know, every time I talk to students, I, I give them an assignment. And first of all, it's to please finish your math homework. Um, and, and the other thing is to go home tonight and invite and invent, sorry, um, near light speed travel. Because I have to tell you, NASA is still basically using the same rocket technology that we used in the 1960s. And the problem with getting beyond our solar system um, to other stars in the Milky Way galaxy, let alone to the other galaxy, right now would take tens to hundreds of thousands of years based on our what we call propulsion technology, what gives you speed, the rocket fuel. And so the problem is, you know, all of us, right, have seen Star Trek and Star Wars and everything where they have this cool thing where they go to hyperspeed and they can travel across. So I need one of you to go home tonight and invent hyperspeed and then we'll be good and we can go visit the Milky Way galaxy. But until then, we're not going anywhere. So no pressure at all to the students with that one. But we, exactly. You will follow up tomorrow and find out if you've succeeded. Please. Uh, all right. Mr. Thwaites' group is grade sixes in St. Thomas, Ontario. Take it away. Now exit out. Go ahead, Monsieur Benedai. Okay. So my question is um, the oxygen and carbon dioxide. Why does it why does it stay in the planet Earth and does not go into outer space? Like, is there like an amazing barrier that only humans can pass? Um, you know, that's a really great question, and there actually is a barrier. You know, there, there's two reasons why the, our atmosphere stays where it is. And the first one is, is partially the same reason that we stay where we are. And I hope you know what that is. It's why we stay on the surface of this planet, and it's a force called gravity. Um, and so gravity is, is basically the attraction of two bodies towards each other, and bodies that are bigger or have more mass create more attraction. So we're held down onto the surface of the earth by gravity. If there were new gravity, we would float around. And if there were no gravity, our atmosphere would actually float away because there'd be nothing holding it here on earth. So gravity hugely protects the surface, our, our atmosphere and keeps us on the surface. The other thing that protects our, our atmosphere is, um, is our magnetic field. So inside the earth, our core is made of iron, um, you know, which is a metal, but the metal is really hot. It's inside the earth. There's a lot of pressure. And so the, the liquid, there's actually a liquid inner core and that core is actually kind of slowly moving around. And as it moves around, it creates a magnetic field. So the earth is actually surrounded by this magnetic field. And that magnetic field is important because as particles come streaming off the sun, the sun has big explosions on the, its surface called solar flares. And when there's a big explosion on the surface of the sun, it's called a coronal mass ejection. Now, when those particles go streaming outward, are, they actually go around the earth because our magnetic field sort of deflects them. It's like a protective shield that protects our atmosphere. Now, what happened to Mars was Mars lost its magnetic field and those particles coming from the sun, we actually call it the solar wind, have been slowly, slowly kind of eroding Mars's atmosphere down to a much thinner atmosphere. So we love our magnetic field. It's super cool. It protects us. But you know, it's not a thing. You can actually pass right through it. But when you do, 
you're out there and you are subjected to those particles streaming from the sun. Now, of course, you can't see them. They're atomic particles but they, actually, they are actually radiation and they can actually do harm to human bodies. So when we send astronauts outside of our magnetic field, we actually have to think about ways to protect them from that solar wind, from those streaming particles. So the magnetic field is way cool. It does great stuff for us. We love our magnetic field. Uh, excellent question, great answer. For the classes too, if you want to see any of that visualized, right now National Geographic has a series called One Strange Rock, where the episode is literally called Shield, and it's an excellent like one hour depiction of that whole process that uh, Dr. Stefan was just mentioning. Uh, all right, let's head to Miss Fox's group, grade three through five in Birmingham, Alabama. So this is a gyms group, um, girls engaged in math and science, and our question is, where did you go to college and what did you study? <laughs> Yay, there's nothing I like better than girls engaged in math and science. You guys are awesome. Uh, so I went to college in Virginia at a place called the College of William and Mary. Uh, and I got an undergraduate degree in geological and geology. So I studied rocks. I studied rocks here on Earth. Then I went to Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. And I got a master's and a doctorate degree also in geology. But in graduate school, I was actually studying the geology of Venus um, using spacecraft data that was actually returned from a Russian spacecraft. Um, so I, I was in college for a really long time, but I really enjoyed it because I love rocks. Excellent. Um, we can tell. Uh, all right, let's uh, do our, our last of the first round of questions with Miss Larger's group, so grade five sixes in North Bay, Ontario. Hello. Hi. Hey, right. Hi, I'm Annie from North Bay, Ontario, and I have two questions. Go ahead, yeah. One, do you think that there could be aliens on Mars? You can ask your second two. Ask both yeah. at the same time. Yeah. And why... Why do we have and need so many planets? Why don't we just need two or three like that? <laughs> okay. Um, do I think there are aliens on Mars? I think there are aliens on Mars, but the disappointing thing for you guys and for lots of people is they're not little green men. They are microbes. So think about something you have to look at in a microscope um, and think about kind of like algae on a pond. Um, and so when we talk about life on Mars, we're talking about life that maybe is only made up of one cell or maybe a few cells. And, and the reason we're pretty sure about that is because here on Earth, when life evolved, it actually stayed in a single cell form for over a billion years. And so the fact that Mars got kind of so cold and nasty probably means that if there is still life on Mars, it's just microbes, which are little tiny single-celled organisms, which is not very fun, right? We want to see like Star Wars aliens, but unfortunately it takes a planet a really, really long time with pretty stable conditions to get to life like us, which is really complex. And we know that from studying the history of life on our own planet. Now the second question, why do we have so many planets? So, you know, when solar systems form, you start out with this hot ball of gas that's a star, and around that hot ball of gas is a cloud of rock and dust and ice. And that ball of rock and dust and ice condenses over millions, if not billions of years into planets. And it does that because the stuff bangs into each other, bangs into each other, bangs into each other. So our planet is actually made of lots of different stuff that banged into each other. And we now call that stuff asteroids and comets. So asteroids are the rock that was left over from when the planets formed, and comets are the ice that was left over from when the planets formed. So how many planets you're gonna get in a solar system, right? We have eight, if you don't count poor Pluto. Um, but if you count Pluto and then you count other large asteroids like Ceres and Vesta, there's a lot of stuff in our solar system. 
And, and so how many planets you have just really depends on how much stuff you begin with. So with Kepler, we've actually, this telescope that NASA had, we've actually seen around other stars, seven planet systems, five planet systems, three planet systems. So it does vary from star to star, but we're only just beginning to figure that out because we haven't had telescopes for very long that could actually study other solar systems besides ours. So as you guys are growing up, you're gonna know way more about this than I know right now because we're gonna be developing and launching bigger and better telescopes. Very cool. Um, I don't think we have time for seven more questions, so what I wanna do before we wrap up is take one more question from Miss Fox's group, because we really wanna celebrate uh, groups of girls in science, and that's what you're all about, Dr. Stofan, so please guys, come on up and... Uh, <laughs> Hi, my name's Kate, and I'd like to ask who inspired you to be who you are now? You know, Kate, that's a really good question. And and I have to say, you know, uh, someone who really inspired me was, was definitely a man named Carl Sagan. So I got to meet him when I was 14 years old. He was working, um, he was the first person that made me realize you could be a geologist and study Mars. And he was actually one of the first people talking about looking for life on Mars. And he was very kind to me. And throughout my, uh, my early career, he was very supportive. And it's always important to find people that encourage you in what you want to do. Um, and to not listen to people who want to discourage you. So my parents really encouraged me. They said, if you want to be a scientist, great. My sister's a lawyer. She didn't end up a scientist. You know, I met people like Carl Sagan who really encouraged me to be a scientist. So those are the kind of people I think of but my other big hero is Katherine Johnson. And I don't know if you all have seen the movie Hidden Figures, but she was an African-American woman who did all the math that helped get humans into space. And you know, people didn't want her to go into meetings. They didn't think she belonged. They didn't think she belonged because she was a woman and because she was African-American. And yet she said to herself, they need me. They're not gonna get humans into space unless I help. Um, and so sometimes when I get discouraged or I feel like, wow, I'm walking into a room where it's all men, nobody looks like me, I think about Katherine Johnson and I think if she can do it, I can do it. Outstanding. Uh, before we wrap up, is there, I mean, that was a pretty outstanding last message. Is there anything else you want to share with the kids before we, before you go? <laughs> you know, I really encourage all of you to think about what you want to do and then go for it because there were many times where I just thought, oh, am I really ever going to be a scientist? Am I going to be someone who gets to study Mars? And, you know, I kept at it and I just kept trying. And so when you get discouraged by class in a class, cause it seems hard, or if somebody actually says people that look like you don't do this, I want you to ignore them. And I want you to think about me telling you, you can do this. You can be that first person to walk on Mars. Outstanding. Uh, so Dr. Stefan, what we do at the end of every hangout, and so you might want to turn down your microphone, uh, I'm going to demute the microphone of every single class, so boys and girls, if you guys could join me all together in saying a big thank you and goodbye to Dr. Stefan for joining us today. Uh, okay. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, everyone. Uh, to all the classes, thanks so much for joining us. We've got two more hangouts today and many more throughout December. Uh, it was a real pleasure. And Dr. Stofan, thank you so much for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule uh, to be a part of this today. All good. Happy to. Thank you so much, guys.